here's Kenneth Hagin. If you have your Bibles tonight, I want you to open them to the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Here the Apostle Paul said in the first part of the fifth verse, I would that ye all spake with tongues. Then in the 18th verse of this same opening, Paul declares, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. I'm going to speak to you on the subject, why speak with tongues? There has been much misunderstanding concerning this matter of speaking with other tongues, which has in some cases brought much damage to the cause of Christ and has certainly robbed multitudes of the blessing which God intended that they should have. One thing is sure and certain. It's not a subject to be cast lightly aside as unimportant to the body of Christ. God does not fill his book with things of minor importance, neither does he make unnecessary statements. Now, in Mark, the 16th chapter, the 17th verse, Jesus declared, go into all the world, first the 15th verse, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it'll not hurt them. They'll lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Now notice that here are five supernatural signs that are to follow believers. One of them is they shall speak with new tongues. Now some folks endeavoring to explain that away said, well, that just means, you know, before you got saved, well, you used to curse, and now you don't curse anymore. Or you used to tell vulgar jokes, but now you don't do that anymore. Or you used to lie, and now then you don't do that anymore. Well, that's true that you don't, but that's not what this is talking about. For the simple reason that all five of these are supernatural. They'll lay hands on the sick, and they'll recover supernaturally. If they drink any deadly thing, it'll not hurt them. They'll take up serpents. Now, that doesn't mean that you handle a serpent just to prove something. Like Paul, he was accidentally bit there, you remember, on the island, and he just shook that serpent off into the fire, and it didn't have any effect on him. All of these are supernatural. You see, why take one of them out and make it natural? They'll cast out devils. No, Jesus did not say that a few believers would speak with other tongues, but he certainly implied that all believers should do so as also does the Apostle Paul. Well, now, why then is it that most believers do not speak with other tongues? I'm sure that there are a number of reasons why. Sometimes it's pertinent to the individual. But I'm also sure that the number one reason is that there has been very little sound, logical, and scriptural teaching as to the scope and to the value, as to the value of speaking with other tongues. Now, oftentimes, our friends of the denominations who do not speak with tongues say, why do you folks give such prominence to speaking with other tongues? Well, the answer is that we do not. But there are several reasons that seem like we do. One reason is that they're always asking us about it <laughs> and compelling us to discuss it. Amen. Another reason is that speaking with tongues is always manifested when one is baptized with the Holy Ghost. And then another reason is tongues and interpretation are distinctive of this dispensation in which we live. And then another reason is Paul gave prominence to it. 
In fact, he gave a whole chapter to it here in this 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Why did he give so much prominence to it? Because then as now, it was much misunderstood. Now, first of all, let's take up the scriptural reasons for speaking with other tongues. I've already given you one, and that is that it's always manifested when one is baptized with the Holy Ghost, or as the scripture also uses the term, filled with the Holy Ghost. Let's turn to Acts chapter 2, and I can quote all these scriptures, but I think I must make a mistake oftentimes by doing so. I want you to turn and read for yourself. We read here from Acts chapter 2, beginning with the first verse and reading through the fourth verse. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Then I want you to turn to the ninth chapter of Acts, and we see here that the Word of God tells us in the 17th verse, and Ananias, well, first, Ananias went his way, this is after the Lord had appeared to him in a vision. We, we uh, look at the 10th verse, and the Scripture said, There was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision. That means Jesus appeared to him. He saw him and heard Jesus speak to him. And said, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I'm here, Lord. He must have been on speaking terms with the Lord. When he saw him and when he spoke to him, he said, Behold, I'm here. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and has seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he has done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now notice the 17th verse. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord even Jesus that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales and he received sight forwith and arose and was baptized. Now notice that it does not say anything about Paul speaking with tongues here. But yet we read where Paul said himself in 1 Corinthians 14, 18, I thank my God I speak with tongues more than ye all. Well, when do you suppose he began to speak with tongues? Must have been just like they did on the day of Pentecost when he, was, when he received the Holy Ghost or was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now look into the 10th chapter of Acts. We will not take time to read so much scripture, but you know about uh, Cornelius, and you know about him praying and an angel appearing to him and telling him to send to Joppa and inquire in the house of one Simon the Tanner for one Simon Peter. And uh, then Peter there went on the housetop to pray and fell into a trance and had a vision. And he saw this great giant sheet let down from heaven by the four corners and with all kinds of beasts, both clean and unclean, and heard a voice from heaven say, Rise, Peter, slay and eat. And he said, Not so, Lord, nothing unclean or common's ever entered to my mouth. And God said, Don't you call that unclean or common which I've cleansed. Well, you see, the Jews looked upon the Gentiles as being unclean, and they wouldn't have anything to do with them. 
but God's getting him ready for the gospel to go to the Gentiles. And he said, don't you call common or unclean that which I'm cleansed. Well, thank God he's cleansed me and he's cleansed you, for, so we're not common and we're not unclean. Glory to God. Can you say amen? amen? And so then these three men came and the Spirit bade him go with them, nothing doubting. And when he got there, he told them how he had seen the angel Cornelius did. His whole household was gathered together. And Peter then began to preach. Then Peter opened his mouth, the 34th verse said, and said, of a truth, I perceive that God's no respecter of persons. Aren't you glad that he isn't? Hallelujah. But now then, the thought I want to get over to you is in the 44th, 45th, and 46th verses. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. Now, how do you know the Holy Ghost fell on them? And they of the circumcision which believe were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. How did they know they had received this gift of the Holy Ghost? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Hallelujah. That's the thing that convinced them that they had received a like experience. Amen. Now, turn to the 19th chapter of Acts. Now, the 10th chapter of Acts happened 10 years after the day of Pentecost. 10 years after the day of Pentecost. And here the Gentiles received this experience and spoke with other tongues. Now, in the 19th chapter of Acts, let's begin to read the first verse. And it came to pass, while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. And finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Under what then were you baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. You see, John the Baptist baptized in water, teaching them to believe on him that should come after him. But you see, they were over here in Ephesus and didn't know what had happened back there in uh, the land of Israel that Jesus had come. They didn't even know about that. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Praise God. And all the men were about 12. Now, I don't know how many women and children there were, but if it's about the same as it is today, there's probably about 12 men and 36 women and children, and maybe a group of about 48 altogether. I do not know that that's true. But now I want you to notice particularly that here four times out of five where it says that they received this experience, that is, were filled with the Holy Ghost or baptized with the Holy Ghost, it said they spoke with other tongues. Paul said he, thank God he spoke with other tongues more than you all. Now turn back to the eighth chapter of Acts and let's read the only other account given in the Acts of the apostles. Now, incidentally, this happening, this incident, this Paul going down to Ephesus, the 19th chapter of Acts, happened 20 years after Acts 2. Now, you see, you read Acts, the second chapter, and over to the 19th, there's just 17 chapters, and just reading that in a few moments or a few minutes, you might think that just happened over a period of a few days, but no, it was 20 years later. When Paul laid hands on these folks, 20 years, that is, after Acts 2, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost and spoke with tongues. Now, here in Acts 8, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them. And many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. Now skip down to the 12th verse. But when they believed Philip, 
preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. That is, baptized in water. Then, now look at the 14th verse. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might be born again. No, no. Prayed for them that they might believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. No. Prayed for them that they might be converted and become Christians. No. What did they do? Prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Now then there are a number of interesting things here. First of all, notice this, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them. There in the Acts 10 we read, while Peter yet spake unto them, the Holy Ghost fell on them. The singers just got through singing about the latter rain. The Holy Ghost falls like rain. You can see that here. That's, a, that's an illustration of the Holy Ghost moving or the Holy Ghost falling. I remember one time there were some individuals that wanted to debate with me, and at one time I used to do that, but then you learn better as you grow older, you know. You should learn a little sense anyway. And so they challenged me, you know, and I said, well, I'm not interested in debate. I never, saw, never did see any good come out of it yet. And, I, and they said, well, no, we, we just want to discuss the Scriptures. Because they said, you see, if you're not saved, if we're not saved, then you are. I said, that's the best evidence in the world that you're not, because I know I am. <laughs> Praise God, amen. Well, we set up a date anyway, and so we were discussing the Scriptures. And when you would pin them with the Scriptures, you know, on whatever set we're discussing, they'd jump, you know, on a little, they had, I call it a little rabbit path down through the New Testament that they get in. And uh, so finally, after about two hours of discussion, I finally said to them, now, I'm not going to talk anymore because I've got service tonight. I I'm going to stop right now unless you agree and we'll both mutually agree that we'll take any subject that you want to discuss, any New Testament subject, and we'll discuss it. We'll not jump on any other subject until both of us consent to do so. Unless you, that's, you agree to that, well, we won't, I won't. Well, they agreed to it. So I said, all right, what subject do you want to discuss? They said, that Holy Ghost business. <laughs> well, I knew right then they didn't know a thing in the world about him. Amen. They didn't know a thing in the world about him. Because, see, Jesus said, I'll pray the Father, and he'll give you another comforter, even the Spirit of truth, that he, that he may abide with you forever. He. And here it said, he, amen, had not fallen upon any of them, or the, the Samaritans. Now, so they said, uh, uh, we want to discuss that Holy Ghost business. I said, well, uh, what do you want to know about him? They said, what is it? I know further that they know even less about him <laughs> because him is not it. <laughs> Amen. And so I said, uh, well, uh, they, they, they said, what is it? I said, you tell me. Well, they said, there it is, right there in your hand. I was holding my study Bible. It's about three inches thick, real big and heavy. My study Bible. Not necessarily one to preach out of, but my study Bible. They said, there it is, right there in your hand. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they're spirit and life. Said, the Bible's the Holy Ghost. Sure enough, I said. <laughs> I'm sure glad you enlightened me. I always wondered what that was that fell on Peter, uh, that fell on Carnesia's household <laughs> while Pe when Peter preached. I said, you know, that uh, if the Bible that fell on them was as big as mine. 
after falling all the way from heaven, it must have knocked all of them out. And the main spokesman got up and said, let's go home. They were three of them. I said, I don't blame you. I believe I'm staying home if I didn't know any more about the Bible than you do. But we didn't help them. Bless their darling hearts and stupid heads. We did our best, but, but we didn't help them. But thank God he does fall. The Holy Ghost falls like rain. Amen. Amen. Because the latter rain is the Holy Ghost. An outpouring, outpouring. Amen. And so then, here's something else to note from this particular section of Scripture. Because you see, as a denominational preacher, because I began my ministry as a Baptist minister, and I was taught, you know, if you're born again, you have the Holy Ghost, and, uh, and, and uh, you see, this statement's partly true and partly false. You have the Holy Ghost, and that's the end of it right there. Well, thank God, if you are born again, you do have the Holy Ghost. That is, He's in you, and He witnesses with your heart that you are a child of God, and He recreates your spirit and causes you to be a new creature in Christ Jesus. But it's one thing to be born of the Spirit, and another thing to be filled with the Spirit. Just like this, water, rain is water. Water is a type of the Holy Ghost. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to have one drink of water, another thing to be full of water. It's one thing to even have a glass of water. Just because you've had a glass of water is no sign you're full of water. Keep on drinking till you get full. Amen. Well, how can you tell when you get full? All I know is it said when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they began to speak. They began to speak. But right on the other hand, notice this. Were th this eighth chapter of Acts helped me, I think, as much or more than any other scripture to see that there is an experience subsequent to salvation called being filled with or baptized with the Holy Ghost. Now notice this. It said they believed the preaching of Philip concerning the things of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ and were baptized both men and women. Well, now were they saved? Well, according to Jesus, they were. We've already read from the 16th chapter of Mark. Go ye into all the world. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. It said they believed Philip preaching the things of the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus and were baptized. So then according to the Lord Jesus Christ, they were saved, weren't they? Right then. But then it said, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God. They sent unto them Peter and John. Well, I decided in discussing this and in studying this that I just asked Peter. Peter, were those people, those Samaritans saved? Were they born again before you and John went down there and laid hands on them that they might receive the Holy Ghost? I mean, what better witness would there be than Peter? He and John went down there. They were sent by the other apostles. And so Peter wrote me a letter. And he wrote you one too, you know. It's found right here in the Bible, First Peter, the very first chapter. Notice the 23rd verse now. Being born again. Were these people born again before Peter and John laid hands on them? and they received the Holy Ghost. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Now go back to Acts 8, 14. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that the Samaritan had received the Word of God. Amen. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the Word of God. So they had received the Word of God. Then according to Peter, they were born again. Amen. So then when he and John came down, they prayed for them, not that they would be born again, not that they would be converted, not that they would become new creatures in Christ Jesus, not that they would be saved, but that they might receive the Holy Ghost. 
though in the new birth there is the act of the Holy Ghost, yet that's not called receiving the Holy Ghost, that's called receiving Christ. Amen? There is an experience subsequent to salvation called receiving the Holy Ghost. Now notice, then they lay their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. Well, someone said it doesn't say they spoke with tongues, so then you can receive this experience without speaking with tongues. Wait a minute, let's go on reading. Look at the 8th verse. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. How did he know they received the Holy Ghost? Is it just an act of faith without any manifestation? No, he saw something. Amen? There had to be something that registered on his physical senses for him to know that they had received. When he saw that through the land on the hands the Holy Ghost was given, well, you can't see the Holy Ghost. He's invisible. If there hadn't been some supernatural manifestation that registered on his physical senses, he couldn't see that they'd received the Holy Ghost. What do you suppose happened here? Must have been the same thing that happened elsewhere. He saw them acting like drunk men and filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with tongues. Now notice and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. Now, some folks have said that Peter, or that uh, he tried to, Simon tried to buy the Holy Ghost. No, he didn't. He tried to buy the ability, the power to lay hands on people and then receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee. Now, when he tried to buy something that you couldn't see whether the folks received anything or not, you couldn't tell whether the folks received anything or not, would he have tried to buy something if there wasn't a supernatural manifestation in connection with it? Well, certainly not. Any sensible person would know better. So he offered them money, saying, give me this power so I can lay hands on folks, you know, and they receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, now just go on reading, thy money perish with thee because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. One Greek scholar points out that the Greek word translated matter here, the root word, is identically the same one, root word in the Greek, in connection with utterance in Acts 2, 4. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Utterance, look the word up. I looked it up then after I read this man said that. I looked it up in strong concordance and the root word is the same. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. What he literally said was, Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter of speaking with other tongues, in this matter of utterance. And so we have proven conclusively uh, in all five instances in the Acts of the Apostles when they received this experience, were filled with the Holy Ghost or baptized with the Holy Ghost, they spoke with other tongues. Now you can just do whatever you want to, but I'll tell you. I always want to receive a biblical experience, not according to what some preacher said, not according to what some church teaching says, but what the Word of God says. And when I saw what the Word of God says, it wasn't matter of, but a matter of a few minutes until I had received this experience, was filled with the Holy Ghost, began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance, praise God, in 1937, and from that day to this, I've either spoken in tongues every single day, prayed in tongues, or sang in tongues, as the Spirit of God gives utterance. I remember reading then several years later from Brother Howard Carter. Brother Carter, Howard Carter, was a pioneer of the Pentecostal movement, founder of the oldest Pentecostal Bible school in the world. 
and uh, general chairman for about 19 years of the Assemblies of God in Great Britain. And Brother Carter said, we must not forget that speaking with other tongues is not only an initial, there are the other evidences to follow, you understand that, initial sign or evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost, but speaking with other tongues is a continual experience for the rest of one's life. It is a flowing stream that should never dry up. It will enrich your life spiritually. Hallelujah. So then let's come back to the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians and read further some things that Paul said, what he said concerning speaking with other tongues and why we should speak. Number one, of course, the spiritual purpose of speaking in tongues is scriptural evidence, initial evidence of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, number two, notice the second verse of this 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. But he that speaketh, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit, he speaketh mysteries. Now notice that he's not talking to men. He's talking to God. Hallelujah. In other words, God has provided a divine supernatural means for us to speak to him supernaturally. A divine means for us to speak to him supernaturally. When somebody said, is that necessary? It must be God provided it. Now notice, he that speaketh in unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. I like the Weymouth translation said, he speaketh divine secrets. I remember my father-in-law, my wife, daddy, they were Methodist. I came along, so I met my wife, passed a little full gospel church in the black land of North Central Texas in 1938 in a little town by the name of Tom Bean, Texas. And in those days, they called me String Bean from Tom Bean. But those days are gone forever. I only weighed 138 pounds. That's with my clothes on. <laughs> and uh, so, I remember my, my father-in-law telling me he was a farmer in that black land of North Central Texas that when somebody came there and they had this revival and then built this church and I came along a few years later as pastor, but they came and held an open air meeting. And uh, so he said they just preached salvation. Little old town, you know, of just a few hundred and farmers all around, farmland and farmers and people came in, preached the new birth and salvation. Did have an altar bench and people would go there and pray and they'd got a lot of people saved whole community was stirred. But then they began to preach this experience. After getting a number of folks saved, running for several weeks, they began to preach being baptized of the Holy Ghost and speaking with other tongues, and that created quite a fur. You can understand that. And, and, and people began to receive and began to speak with other tongues. Well, now, these were depression days in the mid-30s, you see. And, and they were out here in an open-air meeting and they didn't even have electricity. You gotta realize in the 30s out in the country, a lot of times they didn't even have electricity. And, and so they had these uh, uh, gasoline lamps or, or lanterns, you know, that they'd light and hang up the poles around. And somebody said, now I'll tell you, you know, that light will throw out a circle. They, they put something in that light and that gets on you and that makes them speak with tongues. <laughs> and they had all kind of foolish ideas, you know. And, and then, of course, they began to preach healing and preach James 5, 14, is any sick among you, let him pray over them, anoint them with all in the name of the Lord, the prayer of faith, save the sick, the Lord shall raise them up. And you've got to realize this is new to people, you see. And, and so they would anoint them with oil, and so they said they, they put something on them. That's what they do, and they'd lay hands on them. They put something on them, makes them act that way. Boy, don't get up too close, that'll get on you. <laughs> but they need to worry, it won't get on you if you don't want it. Amen. Holy Ghost is a perfect gentleman. 
And so my father-in-law said, there's quiet, you know, just the whole community there divided one side to the other, you know, and a lot of talk, a lot of people going just to see, you know. And, and they'd stand back in the shadows, you know, and away from that light because he didn't want that to get on them. <laughs> and so my dad-in-law said that his neighbor, farmer, got saved. Well, he said, I knew him. I mean, he was an upright citizen, truthful man. And, 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 I, and I knew he wouldn't go in for anything that's fake or anything that's false. I knew that. And so me and another neighbor farmer, we said, well, tell you one thing about it. If he gets that, we'll know it's real because we know him. And he wouldn't go in for anything that's not right. We know that. And so he said, he, you know, all they knew to do in those days was to seek. They'd come to the altar and seek to be filled with this, with the Holy Ghost. Well, he said, we'd stand back in the shadows and watch as close as we dared to get, you know. And so one night, the, 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 the evangelist, the preacher, he was praying with this fellow, and everybody had left the altar, and, every, and, and had left this man. And, and, in fact, uh, Mr. Rooker said, me and this neighbor farmer were the closest people to him. Nobody else any closer than we were, and he was kneeling there just praying, and suddenly lifted both hands and looked up and started speaking in this strange language. And, and Mr. Rooker said, this, his, his farmer neighbor, you know, turned to him and said, oh, what's he saying? What's he saying? What's he saying? And Mr. Rooker said, I don't know. He ain't talking to me. <laughs> now, now, he didn't know how scriptural he was. <laughs> Praise God, he wasn't talking to him. But it convinced them, knowing him, that this is real. But you see, he's right. See, he said, if any man speak in unknown tongue, he speaketh not unto men. He wasn't talking to him, but unto God. Oh, glory to God. Aren't you glad that we can talk to God? And he said here that he speaketh mysteries. That is, he speaks divine secrets. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I think one reason the devil gets mad about this, he can't get in on it. And so he fights every way he can. Now I want you to notice the 14th verse in connection with this, and we'll come back to it later. For if I pray, Paul says, in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. The Amplified Translation said, If I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit, by the Holy Spirit within me, prayeth. You see, it's not the Holy Spirit praying, but it's the Holy Spirit giving utterance to my spirit. And my spirit's doing the praying, but my understanding is unfruitful. See, my understanding don't know what I said unless God gave me interpretation any more than somebody else standing by knows what I said. Well, what good, somebody said, will it do you if you don't know what you said? I, I'm not talking to myself. I'm not praying to myself. I'm not God. Amen. I'm talking to God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Supernatural means of communication to himself, of communication with himself, with God. He's given us this supernatural means of communication. Now then again, for just a moment, go back there to Acts 10. Notice in that 46th verse that they of the circumcision, as many as came with Peter, were astonished because that on the Gentiles was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For we heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Hallelujah, speaking with tongues and magnify God. Well, you know, we, we know something about magnifying. Sometimes we just have a little magnifying glass, you know, and you put it over a word that makes it bigger. Well, now, is, is, can, is, can God be made any bigger than what he is? Well, from his standpoint, no, but from our standpoint, yes. Amen, he can become bigger to us. Can you say Amen. So, another purpose of speaking with other tongues is that believers may magnify God. Now, I know, you know, of course, in my day, I, I don't think there's as much controversy today about speaking with tongues as it was, uh, uh, you know, 40, 45, 46, 47 years ago, 48, 49 years ago when I received. Because... Uh, there's been uh, millions of people have received this experience. 
and spoken with with other tongues. According to the latest statistics, there, there's a, a hundred and uh, twenty some odd million people, praise God, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking other tongues alive and on the earth today. There's been many more received through the years. Hallelujah. And the thing that astounds many of the of the denomination, though, is that on the mission fields of Pentecostal, those that speak with tongues always win more souls than anybody else. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And do the greatest missionary work. And more of them are out there. Praise the Lord. And so it's convinced them that there has to be something to them. Now why? Because you see, they speak with tongues and magnify God. And God's bigger to them. God's not any bigger from God's standpoint, but, but thank God he's a whole lot bigger to them. Well, in my day, you know, I remember my Baptist colleagues, bless their heart, in all sincerity and honesty, but their mind all befuddled with theological concepts that were unscriptural, warned me about these Pentecostal people. I went around them because they believed in healing. I'd been healed, raised up from a deathbed by the power of God, and it strengthened my faith in healing because I'd had to stand alone just as a teenager. You need the faith, the fellowship of those that believe like you do. Amen. And, and so uh, they warned me. I remember one Bible teacher, graduate of, of Baptist seminary. He said, now I, I, I'll admit those full gospel people in most all that they teach and preach is, is uh, fundamental a and it's, it, it's right. But he said, that speaking with tongues is of the devil. And he just got through telling me, I'll admit that they live better lives than we do in the Baptist church. Better lives. And I thought to myself, I didn't answer him right then, but I thought to myself, how in the world could people get something from the devil that would make them better? I thought it was always the other way around. Amen. That the devil's trying to make you bad and do things that's not wrong and e that are not right and evil and wrong but that the Holy Ghost helped you to do right. Amen? And how in the world could you get something from God or from the devil that would make you a better Christian? <laughs> well, that's not very logical thinking. Very illogical, isn't it? But I found that when I was filled with the Holy Ghost, I, I remember the moment that I was filled with the Holy Ghost speaking the other tongues, I really went looking for this man. He's a businessman in our city. And he taught a Bible class in the First Baptist Church, auditorium class. He was a graduate of Baylor Seminary. He had all the education that all the Baptist preachers had. And, and I went and took him up, you see. And I, I brought the subject. I'd never bring the subject up before. He'd always bring it up. But I brought the subject up this time myself because I, I want to get something over to him. And so he finally again warned me, you know, about these folks and about this speaking with tongues is of the devil. I said, now, wait a minute. Stop right there now. Stop right there. You, you, you say this speaking with tongues is of the devil? That's right. Well, I said, if it is, the whole Southern Baptist movement is of the devil. <laughs> and his guys got his biggest saucers. And he opened his mouth and flopped his lips a time or two and did the same thing. It shocked him. What are you talking about, he said. Well, I said, the same Holy Ghost that I got among the Baptists. See, this is just one Holy Ghost. He's not twins or triplets or quadruplets <laughs> or quintuplets. Just one, just one Holy Ghost. I said, the same Holy Ghost that I got born again, that I received into my spirit as an inward witness, same Holy Ghost that I got among the Baptists gave me utterance in other tongues down at the full gospel church, and I spoke with other tongues. They don't have a different spirit than what we got. So I didn't have the same spirit, just a different dimension. Oh, no, no, he said that. No, no, that's not right. I said, wait a minute, wait just a minute. Have you ever spoken with other tongues? He said, no. Well, I said, you're a Bible scholar, aren't you? Oh, yes, graduated by, he went over it again. He's proud of it, graduated Baptist <laughs> seminary. Yes, I've taught the Bible for 25 years. I said, well, now wait just a minute. You've never spoken with other tongues, no. I said, how do you know what spirit it is then? I said, you know the Bible, don't you? Oh, yes. I said, well, Proverbs says, a man that answers a matter before he hears it's a fool. <laughs> now, I said, you are being foolish. You, 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 I'm the only one that can, is qualified to speak on the subject. 
you know about being born again. You know you received the Holy Yes. I said, well, I was born again among the Baptists and received the Holy Ghost. And the same spirit that I got among the Baptists is the one that gave me utterance. Same Holy Ghost. Oh, yeah, but I know it's not so. I said, don't be a fool. We just got through reading the scripture. I just quoted it to you. Man that answers the matter, you can't comment on it. You are not qualified to comment on it. You don't know what spirit it is. Unless you've spoken with tongue, then you can tell me. But I was born again among the Baptists, filled with the Holy Ghost among the Pentecostals, and let me tell you that it's the same Holy Ghost. I didn't get a new spirit. It's identically the same spirit I had all the time. So if speaking of other tongues is the devil, the whole Southern Baptist movement is of the devil. But thank God it isn't. And thank God speaking with tongues is not of the devil. It's all of the Holy Ghost. It's just a deeper dimension of the same spirit. And you can go deeper with God if you want to. Praise the Lord. And so that believers, we heard them, Acts 10, 46 now, we heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Hallelujah. And so one purpose of speaking with tongues is that believers may magnify God. It makes God bigger to them. I notice this much. You know, I was born of the Spirit. I was already pastor of a church, young Baptist boy pastor, and, and, uh, and of course had all the tests and all the temptations that any young person would have or teenager, 18, 19 year old, 20 year old. But I noticed this. After being filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking with other tongues, and praying in tongues every day, when those same tests and the same temptations came, that before sometimes I just skimmed by, I had it added power. It was much easier. Because you see, he was magnified. Glory to God, he was bigger in my life. He was bigger in my life. He was bigger in my life. Now, I was pastor out in the country, a little, I call it a country Baptist church. I actually just read a community church. 85% of us were Baptists. But uh, I, I didn't tell them that I'd received this experience. Uh, you, you know, I think we make a mistake a lot of time telling other people what to do. Well, if I was you, I'd do this or I'd do that. Well, you don't know whether you would or not, unless you was in their shoes. We're very glib about giving, you know, about giving advice to people. We better tell them you pray and see how God leads you because he may lead one person one way and lead another person another way. But some way or another, I just sensed in my spirit. I just sensed in my spirit an inward intuition, more or less. Nothing that the Holy Ghost really said, but more or less an inward intuition that I shouldn't say anything about it. So I never even mentioned that I received this experience, never even mentioned that I received the Holy Ghost or that I speak with other tongues. And, and, and uh, I'm talking about now that believers may magnify God and God will become bigger in their life. But people begin to say to me in my congregation, something's happened to you. What do you mean, I'd say? You know, I'd just act like I didn't know what to do. What do you mean something's happened to me? Well, you're just deeper in the Lord than what you used to be because, you see, he was magnified in my life. Uh, they said, you, 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 you preach better. They'd heard me preach, you know. Now I said, I couldn't tell, really. I thought I still, I preached pretty good both before and after. <laughs> Amen. Now that's purely my opinion. But, but they said, I said, what do you mean you preach better? Well, they said, uh, you, you've got more power than you used to have. When you preach now, and, and you know, it said, just almost knocks us off the pew. Your words are powerful. You see, Jesus was magnified. Praise God in my life. He was magnified. God was bigger in my preaching. Amen? Amen. And so I remember then Mr. R.O. Cox. They, they were three brothers in this community. Mr. J.W. Cox was 91 years old. Mr. R.O. was 89 years old. And then Babe, I never did learn what his name was. Everybody just called him Babe Cox. He was only 72. See, he was, you know, I mean, 89, 91, he's, he was the baby of the family, you see. And, and, and they were, Mr. R.O. Uh, and Mr. J.W., in particular, Mr. R.O. Was, was one of the leading men of the community. And uh, folks, and, and uh, uh, they were Methodist people. Uh, came to church because ours was the only church. And, and so I remember he asked, because I'd stay sometimes uh, in, in, in his home, actually, his he lived with his, his farm, 
but his son-in-law and daughter ran the farm, and, and so I'd walk, go there. I didn't have a car at first. They bought me a car eventually, but I'd just walk out there in the country and preach or thumb a ride and, and, uh, and uh, stay overnight, Sunday night, and then get me a ride back into town or start walking. Somebody come along and pick me up back into town on Monday. But uh, he asked me, Mr. Cox asked me, he said, uh, you, you know, he said, uh, 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 what's happened to you? I said, what do you mean? Well, he said, you're just different than what you used to be. I said, what do you mean I'm different? Well, he said, you've got more power than you used to have. I said, what do you think's happened? Now, he's met He said, I think you've been filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking with other tongues. <laughs> <laughs> he had it all figured out. I said, I sure have. And then he told me. He said, now, there was another man of the congregation that was Presbyterian. And he and his sons and their wives, about five families all together, came there to church. And we had three people come, start coming to church, who were Pentecostal. And so he told me, now it didn't say it to me, but he said to me, this Presbyterian man said to me, now if that, if that speaking with tongues gets in our church, I'm pulling my family out, all five of them. And so he said, uh, he was gone, you see, and I hadn't publicly announced it. In fact, they'd been gone because they were big landowners, owned a lot of acres and acres of that land. They'd, I think they went to Europe for the summer or something. Anyway, they went somewhere and been gone two or three months. They came back. And Mr. Cox said to me that Mr. Curry asked him, said, what happened to our little preacher while I was gone? He said, I, because we'd talked privately and he knew what happened. But he said, I just sort of acted dumb like, said, well, you mean something happened to him? Said, he looks the same to me. Oh, oh yeah, I said, he looks the same. But he said, said he's different. I, I, he, so I said, I said to him, what do you mean he's different? Now, I'm talking about that believers may magnify God. It makes God bigger in their life. It makes God bigger to them and makes God bigger to others. Are you listening to me? That magnifies it. And so he said, uh, he said, something happened to him while he was gone. He said, well, is it good or bad? Oh, he said, it's good. He said, I said to him, what do you think happened to him? Well, he said, I don't know. Well, what do you mean happened to him? He said, well, he's got more power than he used to have. I heard him preach, you see. And when we come back, he's a much more powerful preacher, bigger preacher, better preacher. He meant bigger spiritually, you know, understand. I wasn't any bigger physically. Still weighed 138 pounds. He said, uh, he said he's more powerful. He's got a power that he used to didn't have. He said, Mr. Cox said, I said to him, well, is it good or bad? Oh, he said, it's good. It's blessed. It's a blessing. He said, you know what happened to our little preacher while you were gone? He said, no. He said, he is baptized the Holy Ghost, spoke in other tongues. Well, I remembered that he told me, and I thought I'd better get to him first. I remember he told me, if that speaking of a tongue gets in our church, I'm pulling our families out, five of them. See? So he said he dropped, Mr. Cox told me, he said he dropped his head. And, and he said, I know a few seconds like that seemed like 10 minutes, you know. He just dropped his head and didn't say anything. I didn't know whether he was going to look up and say, well, we're quitting. We're going to put our families out. It's going to create division in the church. Uh, I, I don't know what he's going to say. But he said he looked up, and when he looked up, he was weeping. Tears were in his eyes. And he said, well, I'll tell you one thing about it. It makes a believer in me in the experience. I heard him preach before. I've heard him preach since. There's a power. There's a spirituality. There's, there's something about God, about him, that he didn't have before. See, he was magnified in my life and magnified to him. You say, did they pull out? No, every one of them stayed. We never lost a person. Never. And so finally, after about three months, I began to tell them. So many of them, I began to tell them what happened. Praise God. Amen. 93% of them followed me and the other 3% wanted to, but some or another just didn't. We didn't lose them. They stayed with us. Praise God. That believers may magnify God. Now look at that fourth verse in conclusion, real quickly. Look at that fourth verse of this 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians, and we're going to close right here tonight and pick up here tomorrow night. Notice, he that speaketh the unknown tongue edifieth himself. Glory to God. Edifieth himself. Now what does that mean? He edifies himself. That means he builds himself up. Speaking with other tongues is a means of spiritual edification. It's a means of spiritual edification. 
In fact, those who are Greek scholars tell us that we have a, a term that we use or a word that we use in the English vernacular that's really closer to the meaning of the Greek word that's translated edify than, than the word edify in the English. And that is the word that we use in connection with an automobile battery, charge. See, that battery runs down. You put it on a line and charge it up. We just recently, you know, we got this cold weather come in, and we'll have colder weather. But usually, you know, sometimes you go out to start your car, particular times like that, and, and you get on the start, and there's just enough power there, just maybe turns the motor over a couple of times, and that's it. Or you come to church, left your car out here with the lights on, you go out, the lights are very dim, try to start, it won't start, because you've used up all the power, you see. So you put that battery on the line and charge it. Build it up. See, edify means build up. So literally speaking, he said, he that speak an unknown tongue, edify, unknown tongue, edifies himself, charges himself, builds himself up like a battery. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, those of us who speak with other tongues can say amen to that. Amen. Some of the greatest things, in fact, the greatest things, the most miraculous, we're talking about some of them tomorrow night, things that ever happened to me happened after a time of charging myself. <laughs> Amen, edifying myself, building myself up, praise God, in the Holy Ghost. He that speaks an unknown tongue edifies himself, charges himself, builds himself up like a battery. Praise God. Jude makes a statement in Jude, the 20th verse, you know, just one chapter in Jude. He said, but ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. How are you going to do that? Praying in the Holy Ghost. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Let's stand, everybody, please. Everybody stand. Praise God, I've spoken an hour.